our first. <laughs> we'll try that again. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be our first speaker for this evening. Um, my name is Kate Chapman. I'm an extension educator of entomology with the university. Let's see if my slides want to advance. There we go. And I'm really excited. This is my third year working with the City Nature Challenge. If you're unfamiliar with what it is, or if this is your first year participating in it, it's an annual competition between cities across the globe to find and document plants and wildlife. And so traditionally, um, the city of Lincoln or the county of Lancaster County, um, we try to beat our records from last year. So we try to find more wildlife observations, more species. But we also kind of had like an internal competition against Omaha. Omaha has a city challenge. So um, if you're from Omaha, I'm sorry. But um, yeah, so it's a really fun way to get outdoors, see the wildlife. And even like if you don't have the chance to get out and take pictures yourself, it's really fun to see what other people have observed um, during this period. So for the city of Lincoln, the Lincoln City Nature um, it consists of two different parts. So April 29th through May 2nd, that's going to be our period to really get outside, find wildlife. Any wildlife that you find, it could be insects or invertebrates like we're talking about today. It could be plants, it could be animals, it could be fungi. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a category there too. But really any wildlife that you find, you know, snap a picture because that's an observation. So you can take a picture with phone, you can take it with a camera and upload it to your computer. But after you take a picture, which we call an observation, you're going to upload those observations to iNaturalist. I'll talk a little bit about iNaturalist in a second. And that's going to be our observation period. So you can do that anytime between April 29th and May 2nd. And then May 3rd through 8th, you can also, if you're um, you know, really interested in invertebrates or really interested in birds, and you have like a lot of knowledge or you're interested in learning about how to identify them, you can help us identify observations on iNaturalist. Um, and so iNaturalist, um, you, there's an app for it that's completely free. It's also a website, as you can see here. If you're not used to iNaturalist, um, you can make a, an account for free. And then once you have pictures, either on your phone or your computer, all you have to do is that upper right hand corner, there's that upload button. And you can upload the picture of the wildlife you found. It'll ask you a couple questions about what date you found them, where you found them. Um, I've noticed with pictures I upload just from my phone, it automatically populates that from the pictures data. So that's really easy. Um, and then it'll automatically just add it to the City Nature Challenge. So if you took that observation within Lancaster County, it'll get added to our, um, our community page on iNaturalist, which is seen here. Um, and even if you're not in Lancaster County and you still want to participate, it's going to go towards the global totals of the CNC as well. So even if you're not technically taking pictures for the Lincoln CNC, we still really encourage you to get outside and just kind of participate in this, um, you know, love for and fondness of wildlife. And so if you have any questions, that was a really quick overview of what the City Nature Challenge is and what you can do for the Lincoln City Nature Challenge. Please visit this website from Nebraska Game and Parks. So it's outdoornebraska.gov backslash City Nature Challenge. And that site has everything that you need to learn about. It's going to tell you how you can participate, it's going to give you a link to iNaturalist, tell you how to use iNaturalist. And it also is going to give you a link to um, other webinars that are coming up. So we have more webinars in this, um, this speaker series. And we're gonna have ID parties as well. And um, I'm pretty sure there's some in-person like um, uh, in-person events going on during the actual observation week where you can go outside with um, some, some of our specialists and look for birds, look for bugs, ID plants and things like that. So I really encourage you to visit this website um, because it's just chock full of information. So um, that was what the CNC was. I'm going to go over incredible insects. And then after I'm done, Grace is going to go over incredible macro invertebrates. Um, so bugs that aren't bugs, I, that's the best way I can kind of describe it. But um, so as I mentioned, I'm an extension educator of entomology. So I um, specialize in insects a lot of times. I help homeowners with 
inside insects, you know, the bugs nobody wants to talk about, bed bugs, cockroaches, all of that, not fun stuff. But I also deal a lot with landscape insects as well. And so um, I just want to let you guys know that insects are just a super incredibly diverse group. They're the most diverse group of animals of um, any living thing in the entire world. And even though we live smack dab in the middle of the country in Nebraska, we still have a huge diversity of insects. And the insects that I'm going to talk about for the first part of this talk, you can all find in Nebraska. Most you probably won't be able to find this early in the year. I just kind of want to show you like what's out there and hopefully inspire you to go out and start looking for things, you know, take a little magnifying glass with you really just take a moment to stop and look at the wildlife around you. So um, in this bottom left corner, we have the elephant stag beetle. You might not be able to find that in Lancaster County, but we do get this in the um, southeast corner of the state and they're huge and they're beautiful and just wonderfully fantastic. We have cuckoo wasps, we have weevils, which are kind of the cutest little um, cutest little things of the beetle world. Ambush bugs, we have bright red, um, bright red dragonflies, picture wing flies. A lot of people don't think flies are beautiful, but they can be sometimes. Um, but just, you know, kind of giving you a picture of how diverse they are even here in Nebraska. We might not be able to compete with the tropical rainforest, but we still get some pretty cool ones here as well. And so I'm going to kind of segue into some um, insects in Nebraska that I think are pretty incredible. I'm pretty biased, you know, um, other people might um, be offended that I didn't include some groups here, but like bees, alley. Um, but um, these are some insects that I think are pretty incredible that we can find here in our state. So this first group I absolutely love is moths. So this bottom left corner, um, we have the squash vine borer. And I think it's really important as we take a look at these different insects, just kind of realizing um, their role in our ecosystem and where we might find them. So if you're a gardener, you might recognize that squash vine borer. It's a pretty cool looking moth, but if you grow um, melons or squash, you might completely detest it because it is a pest and it will wipe out your plants. Um, but then we also have these beautiful, huge silk moths that we get here towards the end of summer. Um, the luna moth is probably the most noticeable because, um, or familiar because it has those beautiful bright green leaves. Um, the cecropia moth is the largest moth that we have in the state of Nebraska. The io moth is my personal favorite. Um, plume moths are out right now. Um, and they look just like a little tea. A lot of times you'll see them resting on the side of your house. I see them a lot on the, screen, on the screen of my screen door and windows. So that's a moth that you might be able to find, but they're just so cool looking. It's a little, a little tea moth. And then we also have, we can't you know, exclude caterpillars from this too, because caterpillars turn into butterflies and moths. So we have the saddleback cow, caterpillar. I don't recommend touching, but it's super cool looking. And then I also had to include the Cecropia caterpillar because not only is the huge moth beautiful, but they also have these really large, beautiful caterpillars as well. And because I like to nerd out on moths, I just wanted to share that I have a whole page dedicated to moths of Nebraska, including this poster that I made, um, as well as what I call moth profiles. So if you find a moth and you're interested in knowing what it is and learning more about it, knowing what a caterpillar looks like, just a really quick um, selfish plug to go to go.unl.edu slash Nebraska moth. Um, and usually every year I have a Nebraska moth night too. So stay tuned for that. So our next group is the most um, diverse group of insects. These are beetles. Um, and we have all sorts of beetles here too. And a lot of them, um, like all the other insects, have very diverse lifestyles. So some beetles, like the best beetle in the bottom left corner, you know, they're decomposers. You're gonna be able to find those in um, rotting and decaying logs of wood. So right now in April, one of the best way to find insects is to flip over logs because um, with the exception of the 90 degree weather we had today, um, it's going to be a little cool for a lot of these insects. So a lot of them are going to still be in hiding if they haven't come out yet. So go out there, flip over, flip over logs. Um, I did that all day this, 
this Sunday and um, found quite a few different unique looking things. Most I think Grace will probably cover. Um, but we have fireflies, we have eyed click beetles. These are beetles that literally will make a little click with their body. Um, we have blister beetles. Blister beetles are going to be really common. A lot of people will see them on flowers, but they're called blister beetles because they secrete a substance that can cause your skin to blister. So a lot of insects are pretty to look at, but please don't touch. If you've never seen what a ladybug or a lady beetle larva looks like, they're these beautiful blue and orange colors. A lot of times you'll find them on plants having a nice little snack on aphids. Um, green June beetles are one of our larger scarabs that we get here in Lancaster County. Um, a lot of times you'll see them around gardens because they sometimes can be garden pests. Um, we have uh, longhorn beetles, which are one of my favorite little groups. Um, this one is a locust borer. This one's again showing you that diversity. I mean, have you ever seen like a bright yellow and black beetle that is just pretending that it's a little wasp to scare you away? They're absolutely beautiful. And then we also have tiger beetles. So a lot of times I see the six spotted tiger beetle just flying around on a sidewalk. They're very fast. They're predaceous, but we also think about, um, if you're not familiar with the Salt Creek tiger beetle, is an endangered beetle that is in Lincoln. It's not any, can't be found anywhere else. It's in our salt marshes. So um, just once again, like really honing in on the different types of insects that we have here in Nebraska. I should mention too, if you guys have any questions, please drop them into the chat. I can't see right now, but um, I'll take a look at the end too, or maybe Grace can answer as well. Um, so our next group are mantids. Chances are you're not going to see a mantid for the City Nature Challenge, unless you happen to bring in one of these um, oocicas or egg cases into your house. I've encountered quite a few people that find these out in their yard in the fall or the early spring. And they think it's so cool that mantises are going to hatch out and they make the mistake of bringing it inside because they want to see it hatch. They forget about it and then all of a sudden it's warm in your house while it's still cold outside they think it's spring they think it's summer and they're going to hatch so they are going to be hatching um, this spring slash early summer and these are the two different species that we get here in nebraska we get a third one too but it's a lot less common the european mantis but um people really rave about this huge chinese mantis it gets you know about as long as my hand maybe um, but they're really large mantises. They're really noticeable. Um, they're from China, so they're non-native, but we also have the native Carolina mantis. And I tried to scale these pictures as kind of a size reference to each other. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're quite a bit smaller, but once again, um, it's a native species. These are what their respective egg cases look like. So be on the lookout for those because if you see an egg case, which they are out in abundance right now, you are more than welcome to take a picture because that counts as an observation for the City Nature Challenge. So I wanted to include these um, just because when I think about incredible invertebrates, incredible insects in the state of Nebraska, um, I think of Dobson flies. They come to mind because I've taken my husband um, insect collecting at lights with me a couple of different times and he's absolutely terrified of dobs and flies but i think they are so cool looking so dobs and flies are really cool because their um their larvae are aquatic and they're called helgramites so they're these huge um these huge little larvae that you're going to be finding in the water they're obviously predators if you can't tell by their mouths so they feed on other invertebrates within the water um but when they're adults they look like this so the female is actually the one that can bite. She has those mandibles that look pretty sharp, but the males are the one with these really long, incredible looking mandibles. They don't have the ability to bite because their mandibles are too big to do any damage to us. They're kind of just um, showing, off to, um, showing off to other male dobs and flies. Um, but yeah, so these are pretty amazing. You're only gonna find dobs and flies um, in areas around um, water and they're going to be nocturnal too. So one of the things I always suggest during the city nature challenge is you know, put your porch light on um, for a night and just kind of see what comes to your porch light because there's a lot of insects that are attracted to lights as well. 
just checking my time real quick. Okay. <clears throat> so the next group is wasps. Um, I think wasps are super cool and they're also really diverse. Um, not a lot of people appreciate wasps for what they are. Um, a lot of people are probably familiar with yellow jackets. I had a nest of yellow jackets at my house last fall. Um, wasps are starting to come out. Um, my colleague saw a European paper wasp today. I've had clients call about finding wasps. These, this time of year, these are the queens um, that are emerging from their overwintering sites. So you're not going to be finding like these huge colonies of social wasps, but the wasps are still out there. Um, there's the horn tail in the upper left corner. So that's actually a wood pest. Um, so they dig into the wood and can cause damage. And then the bottom right is a giant ichneumon wasp. And if you've never seen a female giant ichneumon wasp, I would definitely Google pictures or videos of it because they have this super long ovipositor that people will mistake for a stinger. And what they do is they actually drill that ovipositor very carefully into wood and they'll parasitize these horntails. So it's a wasp that parasitizes another wasp, which is really cool. The cicada killer, we're not going to be seeing till um, later in the summer, but these are our largest native wasp species. Um, disclaimer that murder hornets are not a thing and the Asian giant hornet is not in Nebraska. I've gotten a lot of calls over the summer about that. But they're this, just these huge, beautiful wasps as well. And then we have teeny tiny wasps that can parasitize little teeny tiny insects like aphids, um, spider wasps. So you might see a spider or a wasp dragging a spider to its nest, um, mud daubers. So once again, if you see a wasp nest, even if there's nothing currently living in it, that's evidence of wildlife. So you can take a picture of that and upload it to iNaturalist in the CNC. And then I also wanted to include um, this velvet ant. And even though it's called velvet ant, it's actually a wasp in which the females are wingless. So um, it's often mistaken for an ant. It's actually a wingless wasp and it has a very painful sting. So once again, insects are cool to look at, but most of them we shouldn't touch. So this next group um, are true bugs. So we have things like um, that are predatory, like the wheel bug, which will be more late summer, but you might be able to see the little red and black nymphs early on, um, maybe towards when the scene, <coughs> excuse me, the CNC starts. And also a reminder to look in the water too. So not under rocks, not only under rocks and wood, but look into the water because there's aquatic insects as well. We have a giant water bug here in Nebraska, which once again, really big, another look, don't touch insect because they're also called toe biters and they have a pretty painful bite. Um, we have a lot of plant bugs that are overwintering right now. So um, on Sunday, I was flipping over rocks and I found a boatload of squash bugs. Um, also phlox, phlox bugs are overwintering in leaf litter. So you can dig around and leaf litter and compost. And you might be able to find a lot of true bugs like this. Um, the Western conifer seed bug is oftentimes found inside homes in spring. It's what we call a fall invader. So it goes in our, uh, our wall voids when it's looking for warmth. And then spring comes and they all come out and we find a bunch of bugs in our house. Um, hackberry lace bugs, you might be able to find those if you start um, looking over leaves where lace bugs might live. They're really tiny, but they're very beautiful if you look up close. And then of course, um, Stink bugs are another thing that we'll be able to find during this time of year as well. Um, scales, you can find year round. Once again, if you're a gardener or um, into horticulture, scales are probably not the thing that you want to be finding, but they are super cool, incredible insects um, because adult scales don't have legs, they don't have wings, they sit stationary on a plant and they just suck up the plant. Um, so they only have one stage of their life cycle that can walk. That's their first instar stage. And then um, they find a place to sit. They molt. They no longer have their appendages. They just sit there, eat, all happy. Don't we all wish we could do that? Um, and then the female, which you can see in the lacanium scale on the bottom right, um, will 
lay a whole bunch of eggs and then she kind of just becomes this shell to protect her eggs and then those eggs will hatch and the life cycle will start all over again. So these are obviously plant feeders. Um, you can find them on all sorts of different types of plants in the landscape. Um, oyster shell scale you can find on roses. Um, magnolia scale is also really common in Nebraska. So, you know, just take a look at things really up close because they are there. Okay, I'm gonna roll through this really fast because I know I'm short on time, Grace, I'm sorry. So dragonflies and damselflies, we have all sorts of different colors that you can find here. And then if you've never seen an immature dragonfly naya, that bottom right picture, they're also really cool. They're aquatic, so you'll be able to find them in water, but they have this really awesome jaw that just goes out and grabs things. Um, ant lions. You've never seen an ant lion. There's some really cool videos online about how ant lions um, trap ants. So they make these little pits. The immature doodle bug sits at the bottom of the pit waiting for an ant to fall in. And then the adult has these beautiful um, lacy wings. And another thing you're gonna be able to find uh, around this time of year are galls. So a bunch of different insects and invertebrates make a bunch of different galls on um, plant leaves, plant stems. Um, roots, things like that. So we got all sorts of different galls that you can be on the lookout for. And once again, even if you don't see the insect or the invertebrate that causes those galls, it still counts as an observation for the city nature challenge. And then, <coughs> excuse me, we have a lot of really cool bee mimics too. I love including bee mimics. Um, we have bee flies, we have flower flies, we have clear wing moss, and then my personal favorite is the bumblebee robber fly, which I've only ever caught one of at Spring Creek Prairie, but they're super cool and they're often mistaken for bumblebees, especially while they're flying. So what can you find right now in Lancaster County for the CNC? So as I mentioned, there's lots of true bugs, including squash bugs out there that are overwintering leaf litter under rocks. Um, if you flip over logs, there's a good chance that you'll find some termites. Crickets are out there, bagworms are going to be, um, bags are going to be really present on evergreens this time of year and really noticeable because they're going to be brown. Um, if you have milkweed, you might be able to see milkweed bugs this early in the season, um, as well as box elder bugs around and inside homes. Um, brown marmorated stink bug is out. I saw some road beetles over the weekend. And of course, ants. Ants are pretty much present year round. But um, that's just a quick list of um, things that I happen to observe, but I know in years past, a lot of people who have really taken the time to be out and viewing the wildlife have found so much more in April and May. Um, and so really quick of what to look for for insects. Um, you can look for live insects, you can look for dead insects. These are all types of things that you can take pictures for because they count as wildlife and they count as observations for the City Nature Challenge. Um, you can look for cast exoskeletons of insects, so they molt their exoskeleton as they grow. You can look for galls on plants or nests of wasps and bees. Um, you can look for, I went too far, you can look for damage. So under bark of trees, you might be able to find evidence of a beetle making its home there. Um, protective homes. So this is what the bagworm looks like. If you go and find an evergreen, chances are you might be able to find a bagworm. That counts as well. Um, pupil cases, so this is a caterpillar that's been parasitized by a wasp. So that's a two for one in observation, right? You get the caterpillar and the wasp. Hi everybody, my name is Grace Gard and I am the Aquatic Ecology Education Specialist with Nebraska Game and Parks. And I work in our education division. And um, yeah, so I'm here today to talk to you about aquatic macroinvertebrates. Incredible invertebrates is, um, yeah, definitely something we're excited to be sharing with you today, especially as we think ahead to the City Nature Challenge coming up. Um, and so I'm hoping that this will be helpful for you to be able to identify some um, of these macro invertebrates and um, to kind of get us going right off the bat. Um, let's just kind of talk about what is a macro invertebrate. So macro means it's big enough to see without a microscope. So it's um, not necessarily big, but it just means that you can see it pretty well without any type of um, microscope. And then invertebrate means no backbone. So these are gonna be um, different types of 
potentially insects and other other creatures that have no backbone, but maybe some sort of um, other type of body casing that kind of helps protect them. So that's what a macroinvertebrate is. And we are focusing specifically on aquatic ones. So um, I will say I coordinate the trout in the classroom program and we have been uh, dipping for these for the last um, three weeks now and identifying these different species we find in the water. And it's still pretty cold. So that's um, just something to think about as you um, if you do go out looking for some of these for um, the observation period, um, if it's colder, you might not find quite as much, but hopefully we'll have good weather and we'll get to find as many species as possible. Um, and with that, um, I'll also mention that um, we have some trunk resources across the state of Nebraska that um, can specifically help you do this activity. So we have these trunks called aquatic ecology trunks, and um, you can find those on our education page um, on the Nebraska Game and Parks website. And um, essentially you can check these out and they have nets in them, they have some magnifiers, um, just different tools to help you um, basically see if you can find any of these things in the water. So um, that's something to keep in mind too, if you want to specifically go out and look for these. Um, but there are just home utensils you can use to go out and look for these as well. So, um, so aquatic invertebrates and uh, metamorphosis, I just wanted to mention this. Um, these, these insects in the water or just invertebrates in the water are generally larvae or nymphs that begin their life cycle underwater and then they grow and shed their skin. Um, and as they shed their skin time after time, they grow more. Um, and then after a final shedding of that skin, they often have wings. Um, other ones actually go through a whole complete metamorphosis cycle, just like a butterfly. Um, and that, that involves like a pupa stage where they, you know, are not quite a chrysalis looking thing, but it is something similar to that. And so, that's just one thing too I want you to keep in mind as you look in the water because generally you're looking at the um, egg larva nymph stages of an insect that you know most of the time we only recognize the adult form when it's out on land and so these are more of the species that you're going to see in the water and they're essentially like the babies they're the the nymphs and larvae. So commonly seen macroinvertebrates in aquatic environments include mayflies, dragonflies and damselflies, stoneflies, beetles, caddisflies, true flies, and true bugs. And um, Kate mentioned some of these in her presentation, so you might see a couple of repeats, but um, mine are all focused on aquatic species, so ones that you're going to be more likely to find around water. So we'll just kind of go through these. And one of the interesting things about um, macroinvertebrates in aquatic environments is that they can actually indicate water quality. So um, high water quality is going to be, you know, very, uh, these, these species are going to indicate water that's really healthy and doesn't have a lot of pollution. Um, and so we like to also talk about tolerance. So these species have a very low tolerance. Um, they cannot withstand much pollution. So if you find them, that's a pretty good sign that your water is um, not dealing with too many problems. Versus if something has very high tolerance, that means you know that it can withstand a lot of pollution. And um, if you find them, it doesn't necessarily mean the water's bad. It just means that maybe um, it's it's just a better habitat for those species and it might have some, some things in it that make it harder for these other species to survive. So we're going to talk first about high water quality species um, that you might find. And I will say too, these are, some of these are generally found in colder waters, uh, which in Nebraska is not really going to be on the eastern side of the state. That doesn't mean you can't find some of these here. I, I know there's mayflies and a few others, but um, some of these will be a little more common maybe in western Nebraska or around some of those creeks and streams that are a little chillier. Um, but we'll start with mayflies. So um, mayflies, their order is called ephemeroptera. And if you've heard that word ephemeral before, um, basically it's, it's 
it means like lasting a day it means that these species when they become an adult they actually don't last very long they don't even really eat they just kind of um, hatch reproduce after they finally um, become an adult in the in the land terrestrial environments and then um, but they can spend as many as two years um, in a, aquatic environment as a larva or a nymph so um, it's just kind of interesting that they can live super long when it comes to um, you know being a larva but then as soon as they kind of finally emerge as an adult and they have those wings um, they don't last very long so just something unique about them um, for for observation time right now you're probably going to see more of this uh, nymph or larva stage mayflies generally emerge a little bit later when it's going to be warmer so um, be watching in the water for these you'll see they kind of have abdominal gills so that's what that close-up picture is showing so I'll, if you um, are familiar with the the insects have like a head thorax and an abdomen uh, then the abdomen is the part on mayflies that might have some gills they usually have two to three tails off the back of them and there's like 14 families of them. So there's quite a few. And they are all over the board when it comes to what they eat. Herbivores uh, eat lots of decaying matter at the bottom and maybe will eat other aquatic invertebrates as well. So one of that I just wanted to show you is this is the giant mayfly. And this is kind of one of those that burrows, um, the larva will burrow at the bottom of the water and um, could be there for quite a while. Um, and then once they are finally ready and the, the conditions are correct, they will emerge and they're kind of this pale yellow colored mayfly. So those are pretty cool. I actually just saw one of those last summer um, at a lake in Lincoln. So um, yeah, th those are some to watch for as you go out and observe. There's so many different kinds of mayflies though. So they are found um, all over the place. So just kind of look for them and um, know that not all of them look like this type of larva, so they're all unique. Another species you might find are stoneflies. These, uh, as their name indicates, they like to kind of live under stones or on rocks, um, and they prefer that really cold water. So um, they might not be quite as common, but it doesn't mean you couldn't maybe see one um, on the eastern side of the state, but I do think they'd be a little more common where our streams are cooler. And they are what we call shredders, scrapers, or engulfers. Um, they kind of, yeah, scrape off of um, different rocks and leaves and shred the leaves that are at the bottom. So they eat a lot of that material at the bottom. And then they're kind of distinguished as they're, when they're larva um, by two tails at the back. And then they have two tarsal claws. And what tarsal means is kind of their foot each foot would have like two claws on it. So um, yeah, stoneflies are pretty interesting. There's nine families of those in Nebraska, or I guess in not, not all of those might be found in Nebraska, but in, in total, there's nine families. And um, I just wanted to highlight the giant stonefly. This appears to be a, a slightly more common species. And as you can see too, one of the things that um, sets them apart a bit is just they have those three very distinct, um, like their head, and then they've got these three different distinct body parts here. And then you can see clearly they've got the two tarsal claws on each, each foot. Um, so, and then you can see the two tails. So stoneflies are, are, I definitely know that those three body segments in the middle there, those are um, another way to identify them and make sure they are a stonefly and not something else. So. That's one to look for. Then we have caddisflies. And if you are a, a fly fisher uh, or a trout fisher, that these are a species that are, a lot of the flies are made to look like this type of, of insect. So um, they have complete metamorphosis, like a, a kind of like a butterfly um, or a moth. And so their larvae are interesting. They can look all different. Some of them form cases around themselves made out of the material found in their um, environment. So um, they will, you can kind of see in that picture, they'll use like plant material or stones or little tiny pieces of sand and create a case around themselves. And then when they are ready to go through metamorphosis, they will actually kind of go into a pupa stage 
And then when they come out, they look like that one in the smaller circle. And there also are um, other types of the larva that are free floating. Um, and so they, they can look very different depending on um, probably where you are and uh, what type of habitat, habitat that you're looking in. But again, these are found in really high quality water areas. So probably not a local park unless you live kind of further out um, away from where there's sources of pollution. And these are shredders and scrapers as well. And they also collect and filter things found in the water. Um, so you're most likely to see, uh, again, that larva, the different larva stages. And the thing that kind of sets them apart too, that if you're trying to determine if it is a caddisfly, is they have those six legs on a very cylindrical type body. Um, and there are a lot of different kinds of caddisflies out there. So um, one of them that I just was going to mention is the Platte River caddisfly. Obviously, we have the Platte River flowing through Nebraska. So this might be a place you could go and see if you could find any of this type of caddisfly. And as you can see, too, they form that case around themselves out of a lot of that gravel and sand you find in the Platte River. So um, definitely a really cool species and have a fun way of camouflaging into their environment. So something to go look for. Again, they do kind of like that clear, colder water and um, you're gonna be seeing more of those uh, uh, larva version of, of their metamorphosis phase. So the next um, kind of grouping of insects that we're gonna look at are inverts that indicate mid to high water quality. And I do wanna say that um, I do think that these species, you know, there are certain dragonflies and damselflies that might be able to withstand really poor water quality and then others that can prefer, a, they're more sensitive. So they prefer higher water quality. So not all of these fit perfectly into these categories, but I wanted to go through them in this way so that you kind of always have it in your mind. This is a, a cool way that scientists can find out what type of water uh, health is happening in, a, in an environment. So depending on what you find, it's gonna tell you about that water. So these are the ones that kind of are in the mid range and again, they could either shift up or shift down depending on the specific species that we're talking about. So with dragonflies, um, these are going to be strictly aquatic um, larvae. And so you'll, you'll notice too, I'm sure if you've seen uh, dragonflies around, they are always nearby water. And that is because such a huge part of their life cycle is spent underwater as this type of larva. And so they are, dragonflies are really cool. They're a fierce predator and they eat a lot of other invertebrates found in the water, like, um, you know, mosquito larva. They eat those as, as adults, they eat mosquitoes. And as uh, a nymph, they will actually eat the mosquito larva underwater. So they are a great species for helping us out. Um, and they are really distinguished by very large eyes and they have wing pads on that thorax, which you can really see in this big picture. You can see the wings are there. They're not quite ready, obviously, but they are there and they will continue to develop. And then they have this crazy thing called a, a labial mask, which is an elbow-like lower lip. So generally it's, it's like this resting under their, kind of under their top jaw, I guess you could say. Um, and then when they eat, it like comes out like this. So it's pretty cool. They have some, some interesting mouth parts there um, and, and quite a few different types of species that we can find in Nebraska. Um, it does kind of depend on where you are in the state. So um, I, I think UNO might have some resources to help find out like if they would be more common in your area or not. But this is a species that I chose to at least show was this widow skimmer, because I know that I have seen it in Eastern Nebraska. And um, they just have like that very clear, as adults, the black bars on their wings and then the white um, and just kind of two on each wing. And um, so they're also, but as, as their larva, you're gonna see them, um, Underwater, you can really see the interesting like wing growth on this widow skimmer's um, uh, invertebrate or larva stage. And one other thing about dragonfly larva to keep in mind, if you're not sure if it's a dragonfly or something else, 
is uh, if you look kind of towards its rear end, there are like these stiff, three stiff kind of points sticking out there. And those are really good, either three or five, or sometimes even more than that. If you see kind of those stiff points sticking out, that's a very good indication that it's gonna be a dragonfly larva. So that's kind of what you're looking for there. Again, as it warms a little bit more here in the next couple of weeks, these are going to be very commonly found in most bodies of water. So definitely take a look if you can see what kind of dragonflies, um, or at least you'll know it's a dragonfly larva, even if you don't know exactly which type of dragonfly it's going to turn into. And I have a resource I'm going to show you at the end that might help with that a little bit. And I also wanted to touch on damsel flies. These are also in the same type of order as dragonflies. And something that kind of sets them apart is they have a head that is wider than their abdomen. So their head's always going to be a little bit bigger with a skinny body behind it versus dragonflies, which are kind of the opposite. Their body is a little bit fatter and stouter compared to their head. Um, and so they're distinguished by three what are called caudal lamellae. Um, and those are not very easy to see in this current picture, but I think in the next one you'll be able to see. Um, it's like those three tails we see sticking off of sometimes the mayfly. Um, this, the damselflies will have that, and they use those for gas exchange, so they're kind of like um, gills in a way. And uh, there's three different kinds of families, but then many different species of damselflies as well. So um, these are pretty also commonly found in most types of water bodies. And so you should definitely be watching for these. Sometimes they're even like a green color um, and that some of that is probably due to what they're eating in their environment. So, um, and one thing I always like to point out too is dragonflies and damselflies for the most part have a key difference, which is the fact that damselflies have wings that fold on their back um, perfectly like in line with their body versus dragonflies, you know, if they land on something, all four wings are out. Um, and there are a couple of species of damselflies called spread winged damselflies that in science, there's always an exception. But um, for the most part, that's the big way to tell the difference between damselflies and dragonflies as well as their adults. So it's possible you might see some of these um, as adults during the, the time frame for um, observation. So watch out for those. Here is a common species of damselfly called the familiar bluet. And um, gosh, even if you're not really close to water, I know I've seen this species flying around before, um, but what you will wanna look for is that larva in the water. And if you just start looking around and dipping something like a net in the water and, and then putting it in a white container and looking around, you might find that there's a lot more in there than you thought. So this might be a common one for you to see. And you can definitely see how the head is wider than that body. So um, yeah, one of, one of the really common ones too, which makes sense because usually most water is in about the mid range level for quality. Okay, we'll talk about true bugs really quickly. Um, these are the only true bugs of all insect orders. There's a lot of different kinds of them and they all honestly look fairly different. And um, both the adults and the larvae can be aquatic or semi-aquatic. Um, I know this giant water bug is the kind that's in the picture, the big picture. Um, I know I've seen those before like on land and it Good thing I didn't touch it because as Kate mentioned, um, they do bite and it will hurt. So, um, but it was really cool to see them and they have really leathery wings. And that's kind of a, a distinctive thing about this type of, of insect. And then also, um, or I guess I should say true bug. And then they also have um, something that kind of makes them unique is they have piercing or sucking mouth parts. So they will either eat plants or other insects and use that um, mouth part to pierce into whatever it is it's eating and kind of suck that out like a straw. So they're unique. Um, true bugs are really unique. And you can see there's also, um, oh man, water, oh, back swimmer, I think is what you're seeing in the other smaller picture. And I'm showing you because I think it's usually found in a little bit better water quality is the water boatman. So water boatmen and back swimmers, if you can see, they look very similar. Um, the big thing is a back swimmer, if you can kind of notice from this picture, they actually swim upside down under the water. 
Um, and so they actually like are like this under the surface of the water and they kind of skim around and, and eat insects like that versus the water boatman swims like right side. This is the top. It's it swims like a normal in, um, invertebrate that you would think of. So this one's, uh, as you can see, it has kind of those leathery wings again. I've never really seen one leave the water too often, but they have these really cool paddle like um, legs that help propel them through the water in kind of a jerky motion. And so this is a, a cool one to see if you can see it, the water boatman's one to watch for. Um, in terms of beetles, there's so many different kinds of beetles um, that we have in Nebraska, uh, predaceous diving beetles, um, the whirligig beetle, which I'll show on the next slide. But these are the, the largest of all insect orders is beetles, there's so many kinds. And they have that armor-like type of a uh, covering. And then um, all of them are, there's so many kinds that they're all very unique. They have oar-like legs, kind of like I was talking about with the last ones, they just really help propel them through the water. Um, and some of them even have bubbles that they get from the surface and take down and use it like for breathing, for like scuba gear. So um, lots more to learn on this that I can't cover in this amount of time, but. Um, definitely check out different kinds of aquatic beetles because there's some cool ones out there. And they do have more of like a chewing mouth part that sets them apart a little bit. So I wanted to show the whirligig beetle because I think they're really cool and pretty easy to recognize. If you see them spinning around on top of the water in a whirly pattern, that's likely a whirligig beetle. Um, and the website that I use to kind of put some of these pictures in here, um, does a really cool job of showing different angles. So this type of beetle actually has uh, like four eyes. So it has two on the top, as you can see here, and then it actually has two on the bottom that it uses to look under the water simultaneously, which is so crazy to me. Um, and so you could commonly see this as an adult, or if you are, are searching in the water, um, then you might be more likely to see uh, a larva. And as you can see, they look very different from the adult, have that long, narrow body with lots and lots of legs. And then um, just this uh, ventral side view is cool too, because you can see their legs and how each one really helps propel them. If you've seen one of these swimming on the surface of the water, they move very fast. So. Definitely one to watch for. Doesn't even require you to go into the water at all, but to be near to water, you might see one of these on the surface. Um, hopefully as it gets warmer, if it ever does, um, you'll be able to see one of those. And then uh, I put in a few inverts that can withstand low qual water quality. So um, I word it this way, because like I said, it doesn't necessarily mean the water quality is bad. If you find these, it just means that these species can withstand higher um, levels of pollution or kinds of disruption that other species can't withstand. So um, true flies, isopods, and amphipods, which are a little bit different, and then true bugs. So first we'll talk about true flies, and they're from the order Diptera, which if you think about it, di means two, and then Terra means wing, so meaning two wings. That's what that diptera means. And so uh, if you see them out, out as adults, they will have two wings, not like four, like a dragonfly. And they are, as larvae, they are definitely soft bodied, more like worms. Um, and so that makes sense if you think about even houseflies, they have like a very maggot worm like larva. Um, and so different, different kinds of flies do have very different types of larva. Um, but again, most of them will look kind of generally like a worm. And an interesting thing about them is that they won't have any fully developed legs as a larva. So they're not like some of the other ones we've looked at so far that definitely have developed legs. And um, they're a key part of the food web. They're very important as food, honestly, for other things higher above them in the food web. So um, I also wanted to point out, I believe in the smaller circle, it's a crane, that's a crane fly, um, which a lot of people tend to confuse with, you know, they think it's like a giant mosquito when you see it flying around. 
but really um, it's called a crane fly and it's not going to hurt you. So it's very different from a mosquito. So if you didn't know that, um, watch for those flying around as it gets warmer and warmer out. Um, but I had to show the, you know, the one insect we all love so much is the mosquito, um, but it does have a fascinating life cycle that most of us don't know about because we're just too busy not liking them. Um, but they have eggs and then they move on to a, a larva stage that um, was in this last picture too. There's a lot of them in there. Uh, and if you ever look at water and you see these, like they'll just like scrunch around like this um, in the water. So watch for those. And then there's, um, they go into a pupa stage where they transform, um, get wings. And when they emerge, they're an adult mosquito. So they have an interesting uh, life cycle. And um, again, very important foundational member of our food webs. Lots of um, aquatic and terrestrial species eat them. So as much as we maybe don't love them, hopefully we don't see too many of them when we're out making observations, but they will be good to mark down if you do see one. Um, and then going back to true bugs again, which we covered, you know, with the water boatman and the giant water bug, there are other types that you can find, um, like there's a water scorpion in the big, the big circle picture. And then the smaller picture is a water strider. And so these are, um, the they're going to be again kind of that same same type of information where they have piercing or sucking mouth parts um, which makes sense probably for a water scorpion and they are mostly predaceous um, so they're going to be like this water strider they um, again are like kind of the whirligig beetle you can see them more on the surface of the water using that water tension to skate across the water and using Kind of those front legs to really um, catch prey and eat it and that's going to be mostly um, different kinds of aquatic invertebrates so water striders are pretty common and one to look for in most types of water um, i should find out what they look like as a larva but um, yeah that's what they look like as adults and that's mostly what i see when i'm near an aquatic environment um, then I threw in a couple other ones here because I have been doing this, this activity. I've been out looking in aquatic environments at macroinvertebrates. And what I found is, at least currently, we're seeing a lot of these when it's colder. So it's more likely that you might see some of these. But one of them is an isopod. And so these are actually kind of like a type of um, crustacean or you think about like a roly polies or the sow bug or the pill bug. This sow bug, which is in the picture, they are aquatic. So they're, they don't quite roll up like a roly poly does, but they are very similar to them. And there's about 130 species of them that live in freshwater in North America. So there's a lot of different, different kinds of these um, isopods. And they have some distinctive features like seven pairs of walking legs and five pairs of gills, which I believe would be kind of more under, um, underneath their body a little bit. And they are scavengers. They'll eat kind of whatever they can find in the water, um, plants, um, different invertebrates they find. And a really cool thing I learned about them is they are like a marsupial, like a, a kangaroo or a opossum. So when they have young, they actually have them in a, a more of like a pouch and they grow for a little while in there before they ever come out. So pretty cool species. And again, at least right now we're at SRAM, um, SRAM Education Center in SRAM Park near Gretna, Nebraska. Um, we're finding a lot of these. And then we're also finding a lot of scuds, which are an amphipod. And they're very shrimp-like. They have the arch body, like in this picture, and then they're kind of flattened sideways. And so, Sometimes we call them side swimmers as well. And they'll just kind of like shoot water and help move themselves through the water there. And again, very um, base level of the, the food web. A lot of other uh, species eat them. And they're also called detrivores because they eat the decaying matter at the bottom of the water um, body, like, yeah, in the dead leaves and things. So these are two the scud and the sow bug. These are two that we've been seeing a lot of. 
But as it warms up, you'll be seeing a lot more things. Um, so those are all the species I kind of wanted to show. And then just a couple tips with taking photographs. As you can tell, a lot of the pictures I used, it's, it's uh, hard to find pictures of these, honestly. So the better picture you can take with maybe a white background is gonna be the most helpful um, for being able to truly see. And then really good lighting. So um, if, you, if you can just make sure there's no weird glares or reflections, make sure it's in like a white container so that you can really get a good picture and then no um, like ripples on, on the water, that's gonna distract from being able to see, like we can see in this picture almost inside of this insect because the lighting is so good even from maybe underneath of it and then it has that white background. So keep that in mind. Um, if it's on a hand, that's probably okay, but these species do need water generally to breathe. So just try to, I even have some like white muffin tins that I put a species in and then it's in there and it's easier to photograph and then making sure there's no like plants or things in there to distract from um, iNaturalist app being able to tell or someone identifying being able to tell what it is. So I have to give credit that this, this resource is amazing and definitely helped me putting this presentation together. It's called macroinvertebrates.org and it is an atlas of the common freshwater macroinvertebrates of Eastern North America. And as you can see, they set the standard for taking photographs, um, but granted not all of these were alive. So when they're not alive, they look a little strange compared to if you did find a live one. But this um, website is really amazing to be able to go to and, and look. So each grouping is categorized kind of like how I categorize them today. And then you click on it and it literally can show you different viewpoints of the species. Um, it would really help if you weren't sure it could really help you identify some things. And then it even links to iNaturalist and other species that have been found all over the world that relate. So awesome, awesome resource. Can't recommend this one enough. And then another few um, that I like to use that we've even been using for my field trip kids is this IO water benthic macroinvertebrate key. And um, it just covers a wide variety of different species that are common enough. You might find them. Um, it really, like you can see, shows, it lists off a couple of the really distinctive features of the type of species. Um, and then it has some nice illustrations that help at least give you a good idea of what you're looking at. Um, so again, this, if you just look up like Iowa water, benthic macroinvertebrate key, that pops up um, in a Google search. And then the other one is just the Stroud Water Research Center has a pretty decent um, dichotomous key that you can go through. It's kind of like a presentation that they have available. Um, and you can actually scroll through and, and like, you know, try to key out what you found. So those are two good resources I really like. So that is pretty much all I have for you today. Thank you for um, being interested in this. And I really think that if you get out there, you're going to find some really cool things out there in aquatic environments. So um, best of luck with the City Nature Challenge. And I hope you're able to find, find some really good things while you're out there.